Hello. Hello, everybody. Come on and grab seats. Come on down in. Everybody back Hello, there. Everyone. Come on Come in. Come down to the front. Come Take a seat. Us. Don't be shy. Don't sit at the sides there. Yes, um, Susan. Susan. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Rajesh Merchandani from the UN Foundation. Hi, I'm Megan Smith from Shift7. And we want to welcome you to the third day this Sangha of Solution Summit. Let's have a round of applause for Solution <laughs> Summit. And I'm going to invite you once again to give us a round of applause because this is actually the fifth birthday of Solutions Summit. We are as old as the SDGs. In fact, one hour after the SDGs were ratified, innovators were on this stage talking about how they were going to make the SDGs a reality. So that is definitely worth another round of applause, no? One of the things that's so important, we have incredible institutions in our world who we can work together with to modernize. And I really want to thank the United Nations and specifically Carrie is here from UN Local 2030, who is one of the key partners in co-creating out of the Secretary General's office where UN Local 2030 uh, is based, um, is, is part of the group that does this together with our Shift 7 team, the United Nations Foundation, and uh, the Global Innovation Exchange, which is a web partner. So that group comes together in a partnership to go and look for genius innovators who are all over the world, who are already doing something promising or fully solving some form of SDG challenges that we have. If we find them, we can solve it uh, because we can help them. Part of what we do with all innovators is they need a network. They need teammates. And so in this room are a group of acceleration partners. I think we have a slide of them. Here we go. There's, these are our sponsors, sponsors. H&M Foundation, Google for Startups, the Barclays team, and Ericsson, who also coach and help these folks. And then there's also acceleration partners. Um, Who's in this room who's an acceleration partner? Give us a fabulous. So, you know, everyone from uh, the social impact strategy and universities like University of Denver, Endicott College, um, Startup Bootcamp, National Geographic Labs, and many others. And the great thing about the acceleration partners is that many of them have been here on the Solution Summit stage in previous years, and they understand the importance of giving back and remaining on as a mentor to some of the solutions makers each year that that happens. So we're really grateful to you all for coming back and giving your advice and experience of this program and also of the work that you're doing to this crop of solutions makers. You know, we, we started on Tuesday with really solutions that are focused on our living planet, on climate and environment. We heard from people doing genius work in the Caribbean and Arizona on climate smart farms. We heard from the team from Malaysia, from Mako, who are literally taking food waste from our buildings and turning it into soil. Um, we heard from Rex and the Soda team uh, who are using music conservation music, musicians, local musicians who are working with local communities to write songs and turn that into a global movement of consciousness raising around environment and what we can do together. So that was an amazing first day. The second day, we focused on empowerment of all forms, whether it was the LiveOx team, which is allowing those with is the disability challenges to speak uh, from Brazil, that team, or whether it was Club Ciencia from Colombia, who are you know, a, a country which wasn't having enough STEM selections from the youth, not enough graduate students coming home, and doing science clubs all over the rural areas and pulling that in. The Abad team from Lebanon, working on gender-based violence through community organizing, buses, theater, and other pieces. And then in our area of artificial intelligence and automation, how are we going to get everyone to be empowered with being able to code themselves? Computer science for all. And the women texters team from Nigeria in Tech for Dev was here on this stage. So that was that day. Today we turn to... What's left, Megan? Health, wellness, us, you know, and empowering ourselves with uh, the healthy planet, with the healthy people. Because if you can make progress on health goals, you make progress on all the goals. So we have an amazing array of solutions makers talking about health and well-being today. I'm not going to do a spoiler for you. You're going to have to stay tuned to figure out and hear from them themselves. One thing I do want to say, though, is that not only have we heard from amazing solutions makers, but we've heard from you all. I'm looking down the camera to those of you watching on the live stream right now. Thank you already for contributing your suggestions your ideas and your coaching for innovators. Please carry on doing that for us today. Please use our Twitter uh, handle, at SDG Solutions, and let's make this a conversation that's truly global.
Thank you. Now, again, we're here at the United Nations and we're honored to be working with the Local 2030 team in the Secretary General's office um, uh, and the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, who champions. And from her team, we have the amazing Michelle Giles McDonough, who has come every year pretty much uh, to, to welcome everyone. She's the Director of the Sustainable Development Unit in the ex Executive Office of the UN Secretary General. Michelle, welcome. Hello, you can hear me, okay, great. Thanks, Megan. Um, it's really great to be back. This is absolutely my favorite thing out of a ridiculously crazy UN General Assembly week. But it's really nice to be here with everyone, um, friends, colleagues. Uh, we launched the Decade of Action earlier this week for the SDGs. It was a very energetic launch, and you are a big part of that energy because we need you as we move into that decade, because we have to accelerate our efforts uh, and our ambition. Um, we need to raise that ambition if we're gonna meet these goals by 2030. Um, we heard during July we had this high-level week, countries came forward to tell us what they were doing, um, and we also heard through this week, and we know that countries, businesses, communities, people are moving but we're still not yet on track. We still have quite a ways to go. At the pace we're moving, and with the ambition we have now, we have maybe half a chance of getting halfway by 2030. That's not good enough for people. So I'm really happy to be here. I think to at least, I missed the early part on the planet and all the energetic solutions that uh, were presented, but this segment on health and well-being, healthy people for a healthy planet, um, I think is really exciting and there's some really great solutions there. Um, now, there are 10 individuals selected this year, including Cure, Shortchill and Ghana Bamboo Bikes that we're gonna hear from today. And these people are already acting with the kind of ambition that we need for this next decade that's coming up. And the solutions that they offer us are helping to accelerate action in the areas where progress is desperately needed. Health, sustainable transport, gender equality. Um, and so for example, while we've made uh, significant progress on immunization, recent data tells us that this is stalling. That is, around 15% of the global population still have not received the required three doses of vaccination against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. And having actually experienced what that does to you last year, <laughs> being out three months, we need to make sure everybody's vaccinated, that I can tell you. I don't want to spoil Short Chill's presentation of their solution, but let's just say that it is the sort of innovation that will help ensure that those in remote off-grid areas have access to safe vaccines. And Cure. Cure is here today to showcase a solution that can help children that have lost a hand to amputation at an affordable cost. This is incredible. Because if we think about it, every day roughly 20 people are killed or injured by landmines. And that doesn't include all the people who lose a limb from so many other causes every day. And the medical costs that they have to confront for many are insurmountable. And so it is clear that this is an important development that can help many people. And I thank Cure in advance for what it'll come up and share with you today. Also present, uh, presenting today is the Ghana Bamboo Bikes Initiative. Yes, Bamboo Bikes Initiative. It's, they're working on a sustainable and affordable transport solution while at the same time offering an employment opportunity for young rural women. It has the potential to help all those that don't have convenient access to public transport, which is more than 80% of the population in urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa, and likely many, many more in rural areas. I hope uh, that these solution makers and the others that have presented in the past two days, that they're gonna come out of this year's summit with the support that they need to bring their work to the next level. This is crucial. 
Um, I also love the Solution Summit for another reason, um, you know, because it's a really effective tool at driving local action, driving the SDGs at the local level. And Megan mentioned that. That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we're in most direct contact with people. And we're really pleased that Local 2030, the UN initiative that is scaling and accelerating local implementation of the SDGs, is now um, the UN host of the Solution Summit and has helped to catalyze a first Solution Summit that we will be holding in Nairobi, um, that we held in Nairobi this past June. So I look forward to hearing about many more local Solution Summit over the next year. We need to take this out of this wonderful venue here in New York and we need to just multiply this over and over and over again in communities around the world um, because we need you to make sure that these goals happen for people and for planet. And thank you already for what you're doing. You're really amazing, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, thank you so much. And one of the things that's been incredible for us in our partnership with the UN is that many of the UN agencies have come and gotten involved, UN Environmental Program, the UNICEF team, UNDP uh, and others. So the more we can have the, this welcome extended from our wonderful UN uh, teammates, the more these innovators get connected into the network there. Right, shall All we right. get to it? Yeah, let's get to it. Okay, so you heard Michelle there hint at some of the solutions we're gonna be hearing from today on the stage. Let's go straight to the first one. This, when you think about it, if you think about the idea of 3D printing and limbs, it sort of sounds like science fiction a little bit, but it's not. It's a reality, and it's a really important reality in this year, which is the year that we mark the 30th anniversary, uh, anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I think the only treaty that all countries of the UN have ratified. Um, this is an amazing solution. To present it, we're going to invite on in one second Mohamed Dawafi of Cure. From Megan, Tunisia. Tell us, from Tunisia. Tell us a little bit more about it first. Just, he's a youth innovator. One of the things we have, a youth selection committee that looks at the youth innovators. And uh, we hear so much about modern technology, AI, virtual reality, um, machine learning, processing, and 3D printing. And he's putting it all together with his team from Tunisia. So without further ado, Mohamed. Aslema. Hi everyone, my name is Mohamed and I'm from Tunisia. Did you ever imagine that holding the hand of the one you love, grabbing a cup of water when you are thirsty, or even closing your jacket is a luxury? Actually, more than 30 million people around the world don't have access to that luxury because they lost their hands. 40% of them are children and youth, and only 5% have access to prosthetics because it's unavailable in most of the regions in the world. It's highly expensive and if it exists, it has a limited control and sometimes poorly designed. And that leads to them to loss of confidence, loss of happiness, and sometimes psychological disorder. So I founded Cure, a startup that aims to empower people with disabilities to make them superheroes because we believe disabilities are not obstacles but opportunities. We are developing uh, a prosthetic. Not this slide. Can you get back? So we are developing a bionic hand that is 3D printed using an ecological raw material. It has an adjustable socket since children grow fast. It's controlled via muscles, so no need for any surgical intervention to implement it. Easy to use thanks to our AI algorithm and easy to assemble, like Lego, and has a solar and wireless charger since many communities don't have access to electricity. All of that for 1000 and less $1,000, which is 10% of the conventional price of a prosthetic hand. And you'll try to make it open source to impact more people. Here is Khawla, a 17 years old girl who was born with just one hand. So just wearing the prosthetic in an easy way and it will detect her muscle signals and help her to perform the movements that she never had in her life. We think and believe that everyone is unique. So we allow our users to continuously customize their prosthetics and that will help them to be proud of wearing it and exposing that. We are also intending to give them capacity building to have more skills, to have better opportunities in life. 
Now, as a startup, our business model is a B2C, but mainly a B2B with NGOs, clinics and hospitals, fashion tech, and entertainment industry. These amazing milestones wouldn't be reached without this amazing team of engineers, designers, MPTs themselves, and advisors. But also thanks to this international organization that supported us with funding, but also with logistics and training. Today, it's your turn to be part of this dream and to help us empower the 95% of children who didn't have access to Prosadex. So we need mentors and board members, 3D printers and technical assistants. We need the funding of 200,000 US dollars to empower the first 100 child children and we need key partners. And this support will enable children to make their dreams a reality. Aslema, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And here's our contact. Get in touch with us and be part of the dream. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. Mohammed, that's wonderful. Great job. Great job. So Rajesh and I want to welcome up. As we said, every innovator needs an ecosystem of, of partners and colleagues and just Anybody, and that can be everybody. So we want to hear from a group. Each of the innovators in the Solution Summit this past weekend has spent uh, a session of 90 minutes with coaches. Some of these guys are there, and they're going to say a little bit. So where do we want to start? Tell us your name, what your organization, and what, what suggestions, ideas, thoughts, questions do you have for the Cure team led by Mohammed? I guess I'll start since I have the microphone. My name is Alden Zeka. I'm with WeScale Impact. Uh, you know, Mohammed, I've helped several medical device and even prosthetic companies accelerate over the years. And I think your design here of something that's biodegradable or recyclable, a bionic hand that can be made for under $1,000 and customized for the users, not just their needs, but their own aesthetic versus a $10,000 or more solution is just incredible. What can we and the United Nations community generally and the viewers out there do to help you accelerate this and to really help grow? What, what, what do you need from us? Okay, thank you for the good like advice. Um, I think that uh, many people around the world are in a huge need for these prosthetics and we are so close to take it to them and to make them the future superheroes, a new generation of superheroes. We, they will not be able or they will not wait for someone to make the change, they will do it themselves. So we're trying to offer that for less than $1,000 and the conventional price of the cheapest one is at least 10000 So it's not accessible for most of the MPTs. And imagine spending 20 years of your life without a prosthetic because you're growing up and your parents are not able to buy it every six months or one year. It's something horrible. Just imagining having one day of that and I stopped that imagination. So I think that this price with the feature of customizing the prosthetic, continuously customizing, so we have external covers that are removable and that will help them to do it whenever they want, have like colors, designs, and whatever they can dream of. Also, the fact of being adjustable gives them more time to use it. And it's easy to use, easy to assemble, so it's going to be fun for them even to have it. And as I said, also for the solar power thing, it's something that will make, it, make the prosthetic more inclusive and more accessible for people around the world. Thank you. Jessica? Hey. Yeah. Great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jessica, coming from the International Development Innovation Network, which is founded by a group of partners from around the world led by D-Lab at MIT, and I'm also a doctoral student in public health at Harvard. So first of all, I'm really excited that you're gonna be able to join me at MIT and Harvard over the next couple days where we hope to introduce you to more potential partners. Um, and I just wanted to share with everyone a little bit of the list that all the acceleration partners had brainstormed together for you. Um, and so if the audience also can help us connect Mohammed with more people, please contact him. Um, 
So first of all, there are technology development partners, including you know, folks at the MIT D-Lab and Media Lab's prosthetic teams, um, Dr. Hugh Herrett and mechanical engineering, who's done a lot of work in accessibility, people in material science who do shape memory alloys, people in computer science doing artificial intelligence and virtual reality, people um, in medicine and public health at Harvard and John Hopkins, designers at Stanford. We also understand that you need logistics and equipment partners. Um, and you mentioned in particular that you were interested in some of the 3D printers from HP and Ultimaker. And we also wanted to introduce you to African-born 3D printing, AB3D, based out of Nairobi, Kenya, because they're at least in your continent, um, and also that you might be able to leverage companies with supply chains that reach Tunisia to bring you electronic supplies, um, and that you're also interested in more partners working accessibility, including DREV, um, Jaipur Foot, and Able Rise Legs that also does customizable um, prosthetics in India, uh, and David Senge um, from Sierra Leone, who does a lot of great work in this. Um, so my question to you is, uh, do you have um, a specific challenge or two that you'd like to ask these partners to support you in, um, and the audience may be able to help introduce you to more? Yeah, for sure. Actually, every innovators uh, had some struggles and obstacles, but that's one of the reasons to keep fighting for his project. And I think that uh, we have some limited resources in our ecosystem, so uh, maybe I need more access to equipment and components because we are just bringing that from abroad, so maybe uh, some help with some policies to make that easier and more accessible. Also, we still need funding because we have like a combination of hardware and software. Uh, also, the technical assistance to get the expertise from people who are already like in a more advanced stage and as you said some of the communities like enable we can maybe combine our technology to theirs and make it a, a moving hand so they are like all around the world and giving them more movement to their like community can be a good thing for them this uh just, I want to notice how many different connections you just made, like, and thinking about university partners on every continent, you're already working locally with one of the universities. Yeah, uh, I want to thank my university, National Engineering School of Schools, right. for that. And yeah, I'm so happy, like, for the introductions you're going to have at uh, MIT and Harvard, and it's really exciting to get in touch with people from the field and to get more insights about what, what they're doing. And we talked University of Nairobi and, and uh, Mark Rary, like all around the world, there's so many, so reminding people about this opportunity as you're working. Think about the universities, the community colleges, and those near you who are full of students who'd love to be interns on the projects, who are full of genius innovators from engineering and others. Now, the other kind of person is a, a person who's a serial entrepreneur. Yeah. And so we have a former Solution Summit winner on stage with us who's now accelerating a new Solution Summit winner. So introduce yourself, <laughs> Hand. Good morning, my name is Hand al Hanawi. I run Humanitarian Tracker. It's a nonprofit, connects and empowers citizens using innovation and technology for humanitarian causes. So congratulations, Mohammed. Thank you. And first off, I want to offer Humanitarian Tracker tools and assistance in any way possible to connect you with other organizations, analyze your data, or uncover some insights that maybe come from the data that you already have. But I know that you're also using virtual reality to shatter stigma and create opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Actually, once visiting a Tunisian governmental hospital, I found a child who was like eight years old who lost a hand and a leg, and he had to go through physical therapy, which is very stressing, not available all the time and takes too much time. At the same time, he was asking his mom, how can I play now? So I imagined combining all of these ideas and like all of these needs in a platform, like it's physical therapy and training, where they go online in a virtual reality world, they can see their missing hand, they can control it thanks to sensors, and they will be playing and performing a game that simulates the exercises of uh, the therapy. So for example, opening and closing to move from a place to another, or grabbing things in the virtual world, and that will help them to, uh, to train how to use the prosthetic, at, at the same time having fun and enjoying having that prosthetics that will help them to be the future superheroes, as I said. One of the things you were talking about is like Spider-Man moves a particular way or Wonder Woman does some kind of thing and you were having them play in those games. So hopefully we can get a hold of those media companies and see if they'll let us play with some of that. Okay, some amazing possibilities here for you, Mohammed. I'm really pleased for you. Thank you, Accelerators. Thank you. Thank Give you. them a round of applause. Thank you, Mohammed. Let's keep I'm it going. Thank you. Okay. We need a... Uh, okay, accelerators. You, Megan, you tell them about the next one. I'm okay, gonna and we're going to get something interesting. Okay, so uh, next up is going to be a wonderful colleague uh, from Ghana. I actually... Um, 
I want you to first look at this. What do you think, what do you this, think is? this is? What do you is think this? it's like, like another like, uh, dinosaur fossil? Is it a piece of it, art? It seems to be made of bamboo and it's beautiful. Any ideas? I don't know. What do we think, people? What is How this? How about if I turn it over this way? Can you start to picture it now? Maybe Imagine there's seat. handlebars here, there's a seat here, maybe a couple of wheels over here as well. Are you starting to see? What is it? It bicycle. is a bike. Yeah, so the Ghana Bamboo Bicycle Initiative, which uh, this particular bike, um, Eco Ride, is the actual brand of it. I want one. Um, my mom started the Bicycle Club for Western New York State, um, and I got as a child to have the, the joy of riding a bike everywhere. So many people get that joy. Um, you know, but, it's actually uh, light. It feels lighter as it's well. It's so light, and uh, it's, it's, it's cost effective, and it's, it's genius. So our next innovator is already. Uh, doing this in Ghana, scaling it, and doing genius work about getting it not only to those who are their direct customers, but also ways to, to bring it to those who might not have uh, any access to this and might be walking for hours to school. So, so without further ado, let us invite the entrepreneur behind Ghana Bamboo Bikes Initiative, Benice Tapa. Ecorad. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Benis Dapa. I'm the founder of Ghana Bamboo Bikes Initiative, and I'm here to present EcoRide Bamboo Bicycle. Can you imagine when you have to walk an hour or miles before you can go to hospital? We actually need mobility to go to work, to go to hospitals, schools, and other places before we can earn a living. Before we can earn a living. Ghana Bamboo Bikes is having, has come out with a new solution by using abandoned bamboo found around us to manufacture bicycles with bamboo instead of steel. The bicycle is very, very beautiful and very, very strong in our country currently, and we're just trying to see how best we can sell outside both local and international platform. Currently, you can see bamboo is really, really, really a miracle material, and just as stronger as you fast growing, absorb carbon, As we could see, one bamboo bike that we harvest, we plant more than 10 bamboos. I could say we actually grow bikes. We, we, we have also at, trained 31 people currently, and we have also employed them. 16 of them are women, and we have also trained more 85 youths in our country, including 28 girls, which we are hoping to retain them in the industry in the near future. Currently, we have sold more than 200 bamboo frames and bicycles. We sell all over the country, outside the country. We don't actually have our own shop at the moment, but we do partner with distributors to sell our bikes. This is one of the hotels that is showcasing our bicycles in Ghana as a complimentary service for their clients. And also, they also help us to sell more of our bikes in Ghana. As we could see, Ghana Bamboo Bikes Initiative is donate, we are donating a lot of bicycles for school kids that walk miles before they can go to school, farmers, teachers in Ghana. I really like the idea of we donating bikes, especially for girls or young students to go to school because most of them lack access of transportation. And this is really, really helping them to increase their academic performance. Ghana Bamboo Bike works around the sustainable development goals, especially gender equality. You could see employment, climate change, and et cetera. This is the map where we have so far distributed most of our bicycles in Ghana. We have donated a lot of bicycles, and we are hoping to do more in the near future. Currently, we are ready to share our skills to other countries, broaden our scope to teach other people how they can manufacture bicycles, especially where they have abandoned bamboo around them. What we currently need immediately is 
we need 1.5 million immediately so that we can expand our manufacturing capacity to 10,000 bicycles every year. We also need global component suppliers and distributors. We are also looking for more NGOs to collaborate with us so that we can donate more bikes for students, health workers and teachers. We also want to expand our workshop, especially include childcare facility because we want to engage more women in terms of manufacturing in Ghana. We don't want maternity to be I mean, a hindrance for every woman who wants to be part of our movement in terms of promoting sustainable cycling. I would be very, very glad with you to join with us with our movement, ride with us so that we can actually promote the sustainable cycling around the SDGs. Please, if you really want to contact us, kindly email us through info at Ghana Bamboo Bikes or visit our website, www.ghanabamboobikes. Thank you. Yeah. Hold on, keep hold of the mic, Bernice. Thank you so much, Bernice. I'm gonna put Let's the invite our accelerators on. on. Maybe you could gather around the, uh, the bike frame over here. It's you know beautiful. How Look now. how beautiful this is. Thank you. It's not a bike of work. I wouldn't want to get that show. dirty on the streets, actually, I have to say. But I can see the purpose of it. Right, so accelerators, you know how this works. And Mo, we welcome you back. You're five times on this stage as an accelerator, right? Every year. Let's hear from Mo. <laughs> so you know you're going to get good advice from Mo. Take it away. Bernice. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Matamani from Startup Bootcamp Afritech, based in Cape Town. And uh, we run an accelerator program for startups like Bernice. And what you're doing is phenomenal in Ghana. Um, access in Africa is a big problem. And you're providing the basic infrastructure to get people to school, work, and amongst other things. So this is fantastic and phenomenal. Um, what I really want to know, and you know, it's just what else can companies like Startup Bootcamp do to partner with you to scale this across Africa? Because we need more and more of basic infrastructure that allows people to access new um, you know, schools, amongst other things. Currently, we actually poise to offer our brains and skills to other companies, countries who really want to partner with us, especially countries that they have a lot of bamboos. Other companies really want to see how best we can transfer technology for them as a, another source of economic empowerment for them. We're also looking for investors to also partner with us so that we can get components like the wheels to assemble the bikes in different communities in Ghana. Hi, Bernice. I love this idea. I'm a uh, social impact investor myself. Uh, I also had involvement with two bicycle companies. I turned one around in America called Schwinn. Um, I also was involved with a bamboo bicycle company in <laughs> Alabama. Look at that. What are the challenges? And this yeah, this <laughs> happened not by plan, but they ended up in the same place. And so really, like, people work with each other because people are genius colleagues for each other. And it, it's such a good example. Absolutely. I love when these kinds of collisions happen. Um, so I want to I, choose a different word. Yes. <laughs> point, well, point well taken. Uh, intersections. How does that sound? Um, and what I really appreciate being in the impact investing space is when a company actually builds a business model around a sustainable product, but the company itself is sustainable as well. Um, and what I mean by that actually can generate enough profitability to keep moving forward. Um, instead of kind of falling victim to thing, you know, to, to economic circumstances that a lot of social impact companies tend to fail in. So um, I looked at your unit economics. Uh, I like your margin structure. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, sitting in the uh, bench at Shark Tank right now. Uh, and what I want to sort of um, unearth a little bit more with you is what, what does sort of the inventory requirements, what do they look like to get to 10,000 bikes? How many months of inventory do you need uh, of components and, and, and related accessories to actually build the bikes? And, um, and then does that scale, you know, with each of these kind of $1.5 million tranches that you're asking for? Okay. Currently, we're trying to get $1.5 million to see how best we can expand it. So we're looking at how we can get into 
bicycle distributors or who can also uh, get us the, the wheels. And also we're looking at how we can actually get an inventory of about 10,000 bikes, uh, bike parts, so that every bike that is being sold in Ghana, we can get the parts easily to assemble. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. I'm Judith Rodriguez. I'm a research associate at Harvard University, and I work on sustainable infrastructure and healthy cities. And first, I really like your bikes. And I wanted to tell you, like, working with you during the celebration session, we talked a lot about all the health benefits that your solution is bringing and all the SDGs that it's actually supporting. So thinking a little bit about that, I wanted to talk more about the health promoting benefits. So for example, I think that the combination of using bamboo, growing bamboo, and biking makes it a, a, a super health promoting and sustainable mobility option. For example, you are sequestering carbon by the use of bamboo and growing it. And you're also helping reduce emissions in transportation by putting people on, bi on bikes. And biking is also associated to better health outcomes and well-being. And this is because it supports a healthier and active lifestyle where you uh, get the benefits of preventing diseases such as cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, diabetes, and even depression. And I mean, this is wonderful. And given all these health benefits, um, how could cities and other partners help you put more people on bikes? OK. Thank you very much. Currently, we're trying to see how best we can raise campaign in our country, for instance, because the roads in Ghana is not too user-friendly in terms of riding bicycles. So we're trying to see how best, for instance, like uh, uh, Netherlands, how they have bicycle lanes so that more people can ride bicycles. It's not, this campaign is not only going to end in Ghana. We're going to look at how best we can articulate our voice across the world to see how best most government or cities can adapt bicycle lanes for people to ride bicycles safely to reduce more carbon emissions to help the world. It's a really important point on this is that you know, more and more we're seeing around the world companies are not just producing products and selling them, but they are actually active in making a social difference as well. Not just through the products, sure. but exactly what you're doing, the advocacy that you're starting to do about bike lanes in Ghana as well. And I think that's a really important point. Um, Rob, I want to follow up with a quick question to you. I mean, love your thoughts on that point, but as someone who has, in, has experience of exactly this kind of thing before, you know, I can see that you're wowed by the idea, but just like Neo in the film The Matrix, you see through the idea to the ones and zeros of the business plan. What should Benice do next? Uh, the, I mean, the next thing, and most obviously, is raise capital. Um, you know, the, the, the problem or the challenge right now is when you're running a business on very thin margins, um, and just building bikes, you know, to suit, if you will, uh, based on the demand that you have, that's really hard. Um, it's hard to actually gain momentum. And so the capital piece of it's actually quite important. And then also building enough inventory, that's why I asked that question, so that you're not constantly trying to catch up with demand. Because if you can build every bike you sell, I mean, first of all, that's amazing. Um, I mean, that is, that is a strong business. Um, then the next move is to get up into scale because you're never going to have sort of the spaciousness in the business to think about licensing, to think about working with other manufacturers because you're constantly going to be on this treadmill of just trying to crank enough bikes out the factory door. So capital would be the first one. Um, and second, I think really deep partnerships with suppliers um, and your supply chain, getting that really locked down hard. Um, so that they actually can build trust in you. So if you can't get, for example, a line of credit or enough capital, they might actually be willing to advance you parts because they have a heart connection to the business and they care about you as a partner. Okay. Mo, you're in Africa working with all kinds of entrepreneurs. Can you talk a little bit about capital access there? Um, the world's not equal uh, and there hasn't been as much support for entrepreneurs all over the world. And one of the things about the Solutions Summit that we really like to share is how our genius innovators are everywhere. And the more we come up underneath you all uh, in, in this like supportive way with coaching together and then getting the kinds of resources you need uh, is key. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I'm um, just to 
top of Rob's point, um, it's more about partnerships. And uh, with Startup Bootcamp, what we do, we unlock capital from corporate startup collaborations. And uh, I think we spoke extensively during the acceleration sessions that um, looking at companies that are willing to somewhat finance, you know, uh, for, 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 for the production, um, ensure and make sure that, you know, we get more and more um, bicycles on the road. So I think looking at different ways of partnerships, particularly from a corporate perspective, because I think they'll be definitely keen um, to work with you and they'll be wanting to get more bicycles on there. Um, some corporates have big uh, initiatives where they uh, encourage their staff to cycle to work, to carpool together. So looking at how those corporates can actually mobilize themselves to use e rides as well to unlock you know, more and more value of what you're doing and increase the impact of what you're doing. So I think there's a lot of um, opportunity um, from large companies. One, one thing, thank you. I want to also add, uh, thank you as a, as a founder for creating the idea also of having uh, childcare yeah. at the factory uh, where genius innovators, uh, mothers and fathers, uh, could bring their children. And so uh, many people around the world as part of our gender equality goals and just our, our inclusion are taking kids to work into a nursery school in those places and it's, it's best practice right. in the world. Any other comments? I don't know if you want to show us the bike a little bit. Tell us a little bit about it. Okay. There's some metal and, and there's lots of bamboo and some metal, so hold it. So currently, um, we use the abundant bamboo found around in Ghana to manufacture these beautiful Ecoride bamboo bikes. It's easy to produce. As I said, we've trained quite a number of youths in Ghana. We're looking at how we can scale it up to train more youth so that we can sell more bikes to generate revenue as economic empowerment. We're also trying to see how best we can uh, share or I uh, mean share our skills to other countries to also manufacture this bamboo bicycle. This bamboo bicycle is going to be a global product and to also address the SDG 2020. Thank you. Fabulous. And it's uh, it's bamboo, some metal, eco ride. I love that it's like hashtag grow bikes. Uh, you know, and uh, so the Ghana Bamboo Bike Initiative. Thank you. Can I can I add something hey, really quickly? I'm a I'm a total bike nerd and a bike geek, and I yeah, live on bikes in Colorado and New York. And this is actually not even the highest end bike that they make. Yeah. And if you look at the lug work here. Um, and just the care and the craftsmanship that goes into this. This is a beautiful bicycle, right? I mean, this is one that I would be totally proud to ride personally, and you're, the work is amazing that you're doing. And they not have only are you too. saving carbon emissions because you're not in a car and keeping yourself healthy, but to grow the bamboo, you're absorbed, taking carbon out of the atmosphere as well. So Double they whammy. Have, they have tandems. They have some for farmers with baskets. Yeah. You recently did uh, someone, someone with disabilities. Yeah. You were doing yeah. handicapped specialties, yeah. so they can do custom bikes. So currently, we are trying to broaden our product line. So we've, we have our bamboo wheelchair prototype, and we are also, we've also de develop, uh, designed a bamboo litter picker as another form of economic empowerment we are also going to um, generate in our country, which can be also expand to different communities. So as I said, bamboo is a miracle, miracle uh, material, and it's going to be a green gold at this current generation. Green gold. Yeah. I heard that. Grow bikes. Okay. Thank you. All right, so let's much. give a round of applause to Billy. Thank you very much. Somebody Off you go, accelerators. Thank you for taking. He's, he's one of us now, basically. He's basically yes. moving the furniture around. <laughs> Thank you, Mo. <laughs> okay, um, so shall we just recap for people how we got to this point? Sure. A little bit. So, you know, we've been going now for five years, and the Solution Summit has been growing and growing and growing every year. Uh, there's an open web call for entries, which we put out earlier in the year. And then there is a participatory selection process. Do you want to tell us a little right. bit about how that selection process works? So the UN, uh, it's a very straightforward web form and people start submitting and it's incredible to watch it. And actually the list is, is, is open so you can see as they're coming in. I just saw another uh, from Uruguay, another one of our solution makers right there. So what happens is the web form goes up in July, early July. Um, we're going to try to move it to June earlier to even hear more. Across three weeks comes pounding. The world tells us this year, 141 countries, 1,400. 14, more than 1,400 submissions. People already it? solving the SDGs in some form. And what's great is uh, we look for gender balance, 
geobalance everywhere, topical or, or uh, expertise balance. And, uh, and there's also a selection committee, so you can volunteer to be on the selection committee. There are some people in this room from selection committee. Are you in here? Yes, thank you. They've traveled. Thank you so much. They read so many applications together. There's a youth selection committee, which is 30 and under and 30 and above. And they read through all of this and come down with a beautiful bubbling up from the planet of the kind of, of group that we're seeing today. And then the UN and the teams that co-create make the final selection and we we get them here to New York. And the important thing about those selection committees is that you know they're balanced, geographically balanced, gender balanced, and balanced in terms of their expertise as well. So we are getting the broadest cross-section of global expertise that our solutions makers can be reviewed by, and then at some point later, helped by, because there is also already an infrastructure for entrepreneurs, isn't there? Tell yeah, us all over the world. That. All over the world, there are, are you know, incubation places to go and coaches and others, but many people don't know about them. So so this is a way that we can find innovators and then connect them to the global network, but also regional networks. And if there are people on the live stream who know of more acceleration partners beyond the ones that are listed on our website, which is solution-summit.org, uh, tell us more. Tweet at us at the SDG Solutions uh, hashtag to tell us more about what you have in your region so that you can collect some of these folks. It's a concept we call collective genius. All of us together know a lot. All of us together can help genius entrepreneurs all around the world. Some more genius than others. All Absolutely, together. Megan. Uh, <laughs> all right, let us move to our third and final solution maker of this Unga. I see him getting mic'd up there. Um, this is a really interesting idea. You know, vaccination and the ability to vaccinate people around the world is critical to driving global progress. There has been progress made in vaccination rates, but we're still not hitting everyone. And one of the reasons why is something that this idea challenges. Yeah, you know, I was able to serve as the Chief Technology Officer of the United States, which was a real honor to be able to bring and think about science, technology, and innovation, and how it could help all the peoples of the world. And as a child, uh, I was lucky in my high school, just in public school in Buffalo, New York, that our teachers had us do science fair projects. And one of the science fair projects that I got involved with was how to harness energy and store it I was doing solar and wind. President Carter at the time was putting solar panels on the White House. And one of the fundamental like chemistry physics principles we all know about is things melt, things freeze, this idea of solid liquid gas. And so sometimes there's genius people who notice a principle in the world and realize how to leverage that. For example, on solar panels, they're taking silicon that jumps electro, electro, you know, electrons and we put a grid and we can get solar power, right? So sometimes in our planet observations, this next innovator found that water at four degrees is the heaviest. Using that principle and phase change storage, the melt of ice, the solid going solid with ice and water, he's doing the most extraordinary things because so many vaccines are lost because the cold chain can't be maintained, because there's not electricity all the time and there's not a lot of solutions like that. And so, genius innovator who, we wanna tell you, Ian has had a tooth issue and he has come from the dentist and he's gonna take the stage and still present and we love him because innovators just get it done. So, Ian Tansley from Wales, from the UK, sure chill. <laughs> Welcome. Well done, good job. Ah, uh, clicker, clicker, yeah. My name is Ian Tansley. I'm the co-founder of the Shore Chill Company in the UK and the inventor of the Shore Chill technology. Shore Chill is an award-winning and revolutionary cooling technology that saved millions of doses of vaccine from wastage and is opening up opportunities to improve lives and enable renewable energy to be used more widely. Put simply, it's refrigeration reinvented. The innovation came from the pressing need to fix a life-threatening problem. Fifteen years ago, the vaccine cold chain was in big trouble. Studies showed that in some countries, only 25% of the vaccine supplied was making it to the recipient without being damaged. Much of that damage came from freezing. Added to that, power supplies were unreliable and erratic. To solve this, we took a completely fresh approach. Shore chill is a really neat use of a couple of special properties of water. 
We use ice to act as an energy store. We build ice when we have power, and it keeps things cold when the power's off. There's nothing new in that, but ice is dangerous. So to prevent freezing, we use another and perhaps more surprising property of water, that it's heaviest at four degrees centigrade. Warm water rises, and at the same time, water at four degrees, the water that's been cooled by the ice, falls. This circulates naturally and keeps the compartment at a steady four degrees. We build this into our fridges and achieve amazing results. We make a range of vaccine fridges at the moment, and some of them can stay cold, maintaining incredibly stable temperatures for up to two weeks without any power. That's about five times longer than our nearest competitor. Because of the action of the water, the vaccine can never freeze. Working with UNICEF and the World Health Organization, we've got products into 49 countries and have protected over 36 million doses of vaccine so far. But this is just the start. We can see opportunities for the technology to improve lives in a number of other ways. In the medical sector, extending beyond stationary refrigerators into providing the same no-freeze protection to the mobile parts of the cold chain. In the home, for instance, rural households in Kenya, we've seen that having a refrigerator means fewer trips to the shops, saving time, lowering costs by buying in bulk, and having a better quality of food because it's been kept refrigerated. Farmers who can chill their produce directly after har harvesting can significantly add significantly to the value of the food and save on wastage, which might otherwise have been as much as 50% of the crop. And shopkeepers can sell chilled drinks at a premium, and they too can relate and reduce waste by chilling fresh produce. But we shouldn't forget that there are also things we can do to address SDGs closer to home. Smart grids and the rise of the Internet of Things means there's an opportunity to balance loads in electricity grids, which means that more renewable energy can be brought online. Imagine a short chill refrigerator in every home, in every shop and business, able to absorb excess generation when it's available and able to survive without electricity when the power is in short supply. Short chill can play their part in managing the ever-increasing demand for energy in data centres by providing more focused cooling and by having built-in resilience in case of a power outage. We've been working with some amazing partners. They've helped us to identify where we can make the most impact and have provided invaluable market intelligence as well as critical financial support at the early stage of a product development. So we're keen to find more partners who want to work with us. We also need further investment to enable us to go faster and further and to scale in all the areas that we've identified. And we welcome approaches from companies who want to co-develop co with us or simply license the technology to use in their own products. There's so much to do and we look forward to your support. Thank you for your time. Well, you may be wondering how did Ian manage to say all that without moving his lips? Uh, <laughs> or why is he here if there's an audio track on the presentation? The truth of the matter is, Ian, I want to spare you as much as we can. Ian has literally come from having a tooth extracted this week since he's been in, in New York. And you still have anaesthetic. Uh, uh, literally, I've just walked from the dentist and this side of my face is completely frozen. So I'm so going to catch the dribble. So let's I'm hear so, for Ian. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so, so glad I didn't have to get my, my mouth around all that stuff. I don't think I can control half of it. So Come on up. We're going to save you for the accelerators. Thank you. Yeah, so the acceleration partners, again, remember we spend time on the weekend with our innovators, 90 minutes together. And so slide on over. We'll, uh, we want to hear thoughts, ideas, suggestions, things that came up. Then introduce yourself. Great. I'm Noah Gaffney. I am from the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation and also a fellow at Cambridge. And I am just so impressed by what you've managed to achieve. Uh, one of the things that didn't come up in the presentation that we discussed on Sunday was actually your incredible wealth and depth of partnerships. So you work with UN agencies to distribute these refrigerators. You work with the Gates Foundation. In fact, Bill Gates asked you to build a refrigerator that lasted over 30 days, and that was something that you were able to achieve and something that you're testing before you bring it to market more broadly. So I think your track record in this space has been so impressive, and I am so thrilled that you've been able to build partnerships with leaders in this space. 
place, and I look forward to seeing how it continues. Thank you very much. This is such an interesting point about like a minimum viable product. How can you make something that works well and you get it out in the market, but then these partners you're talking about come forward and start working with it, making it more inexpensive, uh, more economies of scale, new innovations that you can add in. So it's a perfect example of that. Uh, yeah, and, and, and there's all that market information. So there's all that thing about getting it out there and understanding really what the market needs and adjusting the design so that, you know, all of that information is very difficult to get. If you're a small company, you can't just go out and, and, and get that. You can't invest in all of that tooling to build even prototypes to put out into the field. Uh, so all of that support, is, that early stage stuff is really, really so important. And one thing I'd like to, one point I'd like to make about the Gates Foundation is the flexibility that they build into the to the, uh, to the programs. So, you know, you, you put in a, an application and you say, I'd like this much money to achieve this objective. And they say, fine, here's the money. Go achieve the objective. I don't care how you get there. I don't care which route you take. It's so unusual uh, and it's so refreshing. So, yeah, it's been great. It's a really good point. And one of the things, because we're here, the governments are here, of course, meaning some governments actually also through their Science Foundation and other kinds of programs have grants too, where, you know, when you're doing something science and technical or that creates more, you know, with the bikes, you need more inventory or uh, physical things that you need to afford or a lab. They can also sometimes do granting, uh, even if it's a for-profit or public benefit or a non-profit, any kind of company, granting as well as investment. Yeah. And so this kind of cleverness from the philanthropy world to really uh, work a little more like how some of the more commercial venture capitalists have, but allow for that space for the innovators to invent and pivot and iterate and learn. It's really such a great, great example. And, and, and the network too. So, you know, you need some resource or you need the use of a particular material or, or machine. You know, they know people who can, who can put you in touch with that. So that network, again, back to your point, uh, is, is, is very, very important. Let's hear for some more accelerators. Hi, I'm Rania from the UN Foundation. Ian, you know, I'm one of your biggest fans, and I'm so impressed that you can speak today. Um, you know, what I think is most amazing about your solution is the technology is actually really simple and has so many applications across the SDGs, from health, as you're already working on, to hunger and cooling data centers, which we know will be increasingly important. Um, can you talk just a little bit about what you need from us to help scale to these new industries? What I need to from scale to you know the new industries beyond vaccines to um, hunger and, and data and the other. Yeah, I think areas. it's well. There's a combination. The 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 ideas and the concepts are at diff very different stages of development. So so some of them we we have a very clear. Uh, roadmap of how we need to get to it and is simply need investment to help us to get there. Other things we need to do quite a lot of research, we need to understand the market much better. Uh, and so, so there's a whole mixture of things and that's where that flexibility comes in. Some, things, some people will be very good at doing some things and helping with some things and some people will be very good at helping with others. So it's, it's, it's a whole mixture. Each one has got a very different kind of profile, a different road to, to achieve success. Cool. Thank you. I love it. Um, I'm Chandler from Elemental Accelerator. Ian, it, it was great working with you on Sunday. And, and I'm curious, one, one thing that really struck me is that, that you've really scaled this solution in, in grid unstable conditions. Um, and I know you mentioned it in your, in your pitch, um, but could you speak more to the, those new markets that you're looking to unlock with, with this technology? So the smart grids and, and that kind of thing? With, with, with you know, economies that have access to, to more a more stable grid. Um, so, so thinking like data centers in yeah, Europe. So, yeah, okay. So, so the point is that renewable energy sources come uh, in, in uh, intermittent form. So you, know, you only get solar energy when the sun shines. You only get wind power when the wind's blowing. Uh, and on a, on a calm night, there's nothing coming in from them. On a, on a windy, sunny day, there's, there's stuff coming in from everywhere. So, um, so having an a, 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 a electrical load that's able to absorb energy when you get the power, but also able to uh, turn itself off when the power isn't available, is really important in, in balancing that load. And these lessons actually come, I spent most of my life in the off-grid market, and most of these lessons come from there. We, we look look to uh, use as much energy as we can when the energy is coming in. We look to store as little as we can, really, because, because storage always costs us money. So, so it's, it, you know, there, there are, yeah. And this is such a, a genius thing. So you're using, obviously, ice. Um, and as it melts, that four degrees drops 
with the heaviness and then the vaccines can be there cooled at the perfect temperature and the electric grid is off but the ice continues to melt and having enough store charge of ice to continue to maintain that. And to Chandler's point, and I mentioned as a high schooler, I did a little bit of this, we were using waxes and letting the sun melt the wax at a temperature just above room temperature. And then at night, this, uh, this, this well, the wax that was liquid would go back to solid, giving us heat into the room at that perfect temperature. You know, and so this genus idea of phase change and exploiting or finding, discovering uh, physics and chemistry principles that can be then be used in some ingenious human way that your team came up with, that you came up with, and then are starting to productize for all different storage of heat at the right temperature for the right application is wonderful. And so we love this. I don't know if there's any other comment from anyone, but I think we're, we're, I think we, 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 we are at our 10th, Excel, 10th entrepreneur and, and innovator, solution maker, and our accelerators. I want to thank Rania from UN Foundation because she and the UN Foundation team, <laughs> together with Shift7 and Susan and David, we do this together. Susan Myers, Legna's in here, and of course, Rajesh and, and Kai. So thank you, and it takes a network to solve things. So thank you, team. Thank you. Yeah. So that is it for yeah. another year. Another year. 10 solutions this year, 60 in all. So is it 60 over we, the five years? Or we had six, over, 60, over 60, not only from the UN Solutions Summit, we also did Nairobi and also partnered with uh, the global, the GLISPA, the Go Global Island Partnership and HDG and those for those on islands who are suffering, especially from hurricanes and others. So islands of innovators. All over the world are innovators. Everywhere are innovators. What can we do to find them of all ages, all expertise areas who have genius solutions. Some of them are technical, some of them are artistic. We heard conservation music earlier using music and local language to lift up our consciousness about environmental challenges in our hometown, the climate change that's happening now. You know, from that kind of an idea to the bikes, to, to energy storage, to uh, science clubs in Columbia, we've seen an amazing group of entrepreneurs. I hope you will retweet and share them and Instagram and every kind of application we have um, at as CG Solutions. And, and check out the website, solutions-summit.org, yep. for more details of how we're going to be back next year. Next year, and hopefully regional. Come join us. Let us know your ideas. Thank you very much. And again, to Thank the sponsors. Thanks for the support.